Now at five, a grim reminder of the toll COVID has taken on our community. Oregon surpasses 2,500 coronavirus related deaths. The latest on the pandemic. Plus, May Day demonstrations turn destructive in Portland. A riot declared downtown. Details on the damage and arrests. It's Sunday, May 2nd, and on this day in 1994, Nelson Mandela celebrated becoming the first black president in South Africa's history. The news starts now. More damage and destruction downtown Portland once again, the target last night for breaking windows and other vandalism. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Brittany Folgers. Police declared a riot and made six arrests. And if this sounds familiar, it's because it is. Tim Gordon talked to people who were enjoying downtown Portland today about what's been happening at night. You know, our day started by coming to downtown Portland and seeing the boarding up and damage from the latest destruction last night. But then we realized it's a beautiful day at Pioneer Courthouse Square. People are out and about. So we decided to talk to them about this tale of two cities. Night after night, we're seeing the dark side of Portland, a group of people doing what they call direct action, and the action is destructive. Shattering glass, then police make some arrests and find things like knives, slingshots, and hammers in the process. I don't see no sense in breaking windows. In the light of day, the square looks great, with folks enjoying some sun on the bricks. But native Portlander Ricky Grixby is also seeing the damage and calling it out. That's stupid. I, you know, I don't mind marching up the street, you know, and everything, but, and then you're gonna start breaking windows? No. At a table nearby, three guys are enjoying a meal and conversation that had turned to Portland and what's happening. We are all live in this, you know, around the city core, and uh, it's really quite nice. Um, and uh, a lot of the stigma uh, we find is, you know, kind of, Overrated. That said, Evan does not agree with the vandals' tactics, and neither does his friend Taylor, who did not mince words. And I think if they're trying to counter, you know, maybe some of the extreme conservatives, they're at least as moronic as the Proud Boys. Any of these fools out there getting in fights, you know, threatening people, it makes no sense to me. At another table was Natalie Torres and her children. The whole family came up from Monmouth to visit the city they love, and Natalie noticed. That all the windows are boarded up, there's a lot of tagging, there's a lot of trash on the sidewalks. A city known for food carts and a friendly way is still a great place to be, but the nighttime violence and destruction we found no support for today. Yeah, it's pointless to me. I don't think that there's a need for it. I think what needs to be heard is being heard. And then, then there's just people that are adding chaos just because they have nothing better to do. Tim Gordon, KGW News. And these are a few of the other items Portland police seized yesterday. Police say this baseball bat was confiscated after a fight between two people was broken up along with a knife, body armor and flare. Now that was earlier in the day. 26 year old Michael Isaacs of Portland was charged with menacing and disorderly conduct. Police say these items were taken later in the day as police made targeted arrests. 36 year old Phoebe Loomis of Portland was charged with criminal mischief. This helmet, gloves, metal tool, bear spray and gas mask were all seized. We have an update now about millions in tax dollars. Just a few months ago, some Portland firefighters thought that they were on the chopping block, but now a new proposal could hold them over for a little longer. Galen Etlin breaks it down. Earlier this year, Portland Fire and Rescue faced about $6 million in proposed cuts. But now, a new proposal from Mayor Ted Wheeler restores some of that money. Where do we stand now? We are very appreciative of the mayor's budget. I think that he definitely uh, made a decision to put um, frontline services and, and boots on the ground. Alan Fershweiler is president of the Portland Firefighters Association. The union and fire chief pushed back on the originally proposed cuts, which would have closed a fire station and eliminated some frontline responder positions. The mayor's new proposal will keep that from happening at least this year. It was a good start. The Fire Bureau will still have to cut some vacant administrative positions. We'll absolutely be fighting to get those positions back. And the unions already wary of future cuts. The biggest concern was the budget note that the mayor put in there to reduce our staffing in fiscal year 2023. He says that would cut into the rapid response vehicle program, smaller teams of firefighters that respond to emergencies. Not all calls fit into a fire response or police response. 
there are many calls that can go a different direction. Mike Myers is Portland's former fire chief and current emergency management director. This year, he was recently assigned to help streamline police, fire, and 911 services. He spoke with KGW in March about the bigger picture of reallocating emergency funds. If we continue uh, as Portland to grow into the future and we, cons- and we just have traditional siloed bureaus doing the same work that they've always done and we don't look at this holistically, we will be a more expensive operation. The new budget reflects this, with nearly a million being given to Portland Street Response, which works to address more calls about mental health crises. The Firefighters Union is happy about that too. In the Fire Bureau, there's calls we shouldn't be going on, and everybody agrees on that. But in a city budget of $5.7 billion, Public safety bureaus are 40% of or more of the general fund. The union knows future money is not a given and hopes federal COVID aid Portland has saved can keep fire positions filled. Some opportunities to serve the public with that money, and we're hoping that goes to a good use as well. Galen Etlin, KGW News. Now let's turn our attention to the pandemic and the numbers reported just today in Oregon. The state reported 756 new and confirmed COVID cases and three new deaths. But here's the thing that brings the total to more than 2,500 people who have now died from the virus here in our state and hospitalizations are climbing too. There are at least 345 people across Oregon occupying beds. On the vaccination front, more than 22,000 shots were added to the state registry, well below the seven-day average of 33,710. Some students in Vancouver schools will start seeing their teachers and classmates in person a little more often. Currently, students are using a hybrid schedule and only go in person a couple days a week. Well, starting this week, kids in preschool through third grade will get four days a week of in-person learning. And starting next week, fourth through sixth graders will also get a new schedule. So will high school freshmen. All other students will remain in hybrid learning. And we have an update now to a story we brought you earlier this week. The Centennial School District had to cancel classes last week because of a cybersecurity issue. According to the district website, schools are distributing work packets for students in their parking lots. Students in cohort A, cohort A can get theirs when they attend class tomorrow in person. Middle school students in cohort B can pick up theirs tomorrow between 1 and 3.30 in the Centennial Middle School parking lot. And high schoolers can get theirs tomorrow tomorrow between 8.30 and 11.30 and 12.30 and 2 in the afternoon. The daily coronavirus death toll in India has hit a new peak and hospitals there are overwhelmed with new cases. Nearly 400,000 new cases and more than 3,600 deaths in just the last 24 hours. With hospitals and morgues completely full, people are dying at home and being cremated in the streets. Their lives are not being counted as part of the death toll either. International aid has arrived, but with a country of 1.4 billion, it will barely make a dent. People are not dying because of the disease. People are dying because they are not getting medical care. That is sufficient reason to feel angry. Starting Tuesday, flights from the U.S. to India will start to be restricted to try and stop a new variant from taking hold here. It has been detected in the states, but it appears the vaccines approved here do work against it. U.S. officials are denying a report by Iran's state-run media that says Washington, the U.K., and the Islamic Republic have reached a deal to swap prisoners for billions of dollars. The report quotes an Iranian official that says the swap is in exchange for the release of $7 billion in frozen funds and did not name the Iranians that uh, Tehran sought to be freed. The broadcaster has long been controlled by hardliners, and at this report, It comes as a conflict between them and Iranian President Hassan Rouhani grows leading up to an election. It's not clear if the report represents an attempt to disrupt ongoing nuclear negotiations or is sabotage of any potential prisoner exchange for funds with the West. 
North Korea is warning the U.S. it will face a sufficient, a significant, excuse me, situation if it continues to pursue its, quote, hostile policy towards their nuclear program. The statement comes as the Biden administration is set to unveil a new strategy to deal with North Korea. It also says President Biden made a mistake last week by calling North Korea and Iran's nuclear programs a security threat. These latest comments show the isolated country plans to continue its nuclear program, and experts believe it will continue to test Biden with provocative actions like missile launches. Coming up here at